I want to begin this section by talking about the advantages of using analytical frames for teaching complex subjects. And analytic frames are really a shortcut devices to cover a lot of territory. And the reason they are so important, I think, is because when you do your readings, when you do articles, when you read articles and read uh, various texts and so forth, you're going to have a hard time remembering these. The advantage of analytic frames are that, the advantages are that it's a shortcut device that allows you to integrate various themes and topics that you have read. And hopefully, that would be an important mnemonic way for you to remember the material. It also has an additional advantage when you use analytical frame in that it allows you to really go beneath the surface and ask questions that normally you would not ask without such a frame. And I want to begin with uh, one such frame that I have used in the past and I'm going to be using, and that is the use of the pyramid. But this time, I want to use it as a, a, as a means of deciphering uh, what I call the public opinion. So <clears throat> if you look at this, uh, uh, as I said, this, this could be very confusing unless you rely on these analytical frames to be able to uh, distinguish various elements of it. And what I'm going to do is to view the public in terms of this triangle, try to subdivide the various segments of the public with respect to their uh, opinion. The first segment would be the 5 to 10 percent of the public. And by the way, the percentages that I'm giving you are based on a lot of survey research data. So in other words, there is an empirical basis for choosing these numbers. At the very top of the pyramid is the 5 to 10 percentage of the population. And if you ask yourself, who are these people? Well, the answer to it is that these are people who read newspapers and they read it pretty thoroughly. Uh, these people are fully aware of the crisis of the day. If you give them tests of knowledge of history, they will perform exceptionally well. They're the people who also read op-eds in newspapers. Uh, these are editorials written by uh, experts in the field. And therefore, these are very, very knowledgeable people. And I'm putting them in about 5 to 10% of the population. The next uh, segment is 10 to 15%, depending whether the first one is 5 or 10%. Now, who are these people? Well, these are people who look at a newspaper. They usually read the headlines and maybe a few paragraphs into the story, but then they move on to other sections that really interest them. People in this category are those who know the major crisis of the time. But if you want to see the difference between the, the, this, this group and the top group, you can think of it this way. Only the, the top group would know, for example, which side in a conflict the United States supports for sure. Let me give you an example. Some years ago, in New York Times, there was a poll uh, that asked the public opinion regarding two conflicts that we were involved in simultaneously during the Reagan administration. One was in El Salvador, and the other one was in Nicaragua. Only 12% of the people could tell which side we were supporting in either one of those conflicts. And only 4% knew for sure which side in bo on both conflicts we were on. Let me give you one more example. Uh, in 1979, uh, Iran took American diplomats as hostages, and it became known as the hostage crisis. It really was a news that was very well covered. In fact, it was covered for 444 days. It gave birth 
to the ABC program, The Nightline, and it turned Ted Koppel, uh, the anchor for that program, into a household name. A year or so later, only 11% of the Americans knew for sure whether it was Iraq or Iran that was holding the hostages. Now remember, these are major news items that were covered on a daily basis. So therefore, when we talk about this, and you see only about 5 to 6, 7 percent really know the answer, you can see the difference between the very top group, the 5 to 10 percent that I mentioned, and the next group, the 10 to 15 percent. The next group are the 40 percent uh, below that. And these are people who take the newspaper, they pay virtually no attention to the news, and they go straight to the section that they are interested. For men, that's easy to predict. It's usually the sports. For the females, uh, they go to several different places. Now, let me ask you a question. If you're a businessman and you want to make a lot of profit with your newspaper, and you have a choice of these three groups that I just mentioned. Which one you would be marketing for? In other words, which one would make the most sense for you if you want to make the greatest profit? Well, obviously, it's going to be this 40% because they're the largest. And that is exactly what happened. Uh, in the 80s, uh, there was a newspaper uh, that was catered especially for that 40% group. And that newspaper is known as the USA Today because it suddenly realized there is a market niche for, for them in that 40%. And their marketing strategy was very nicely outlined by an article in Wall Street Journals uh, around that time. And basically what they said was this. These people get most of their news, that is this 40%, they get most of their news from television. Therefore, next time when you look at the USA Today a newspaper dispensing machine, look at the way it's shaped. It's shaped like a TV. And then the other thing was to make sure there are a lot of vivid colors, lots of graphics. When you look at the weather report, it's almost a piece of art. So there's a lot of these type of information there. And uh, therefore, <clears throat> it's closest thing to make the news or turn the news into entertainment. And when you look at this, uh, you will see that it was very successful. Very swiftly, uh, the subscription to that uh, magazine, U to that newspaper, USA Today, began to spread and, and, and became very, very large compared to the newspapers that the top uh, five or ten percent, such as the New York Times, such as the Washington Post, that people read. So uh, you can see that this is a very, very important segment. And then we get to the bottom 40 percent. It really is comprised of people, for lack of better terms, at least politically, they're out of it. They don't vote and they really don't know much about the world. However, these people may know a lot about something that is of interest to them. And when you look at that group, if you look at the 20%, the, la the bottom 20% within that, that last 40%, these are the people that I call unreachables. And these are people that really, uh, even if you have a charismatic leader, even if you have a major crisis, they may not even become mobilized or interested uh, in any way. I remember I was uh, in West Virginia on a backpacking trip, and I met one of these individuals. And really, uh, th this person had no idea about the modern world. But the person may have known a lot of other things, but not much about the modern world. So uh, who are these 20%? Well, Years ago, Gallup poll uh, did a nationwide survey and asked the question, notice the question, what type of government communist China has? 20% responded by saying they don't know. So we have a case in which even the answer was already in the question, 
but these people really paid no attention to it. So that is an important point. If you remember when I talked about mass politics and I talked about the line going down from 5 to 10% in terms of political participation, it becomes a mass political society when it reaches the 80%. The bottom 20% in any society is totally non-participant. And even if you get a charismatic leader, they will have a tough time being able to mobilize that group. So this brings me to another important distinction, and that is if you look at the pyramid, you will see that the top 5 to 10% are the people I call the attentive public. So the attentive public really comprises no more than 5 to 10% of the population. The remainder are the non-attentive public. So this is an important distinction. So later on when I refer to the attentive public, I'm talking about the individuals that are very well informed about politics and they know the crisis of the day, they know which side we're on, and I'm proposing that that number is not very large. In fact, it's rather small. The other thing that I want to mention in this context is that this pattern is not unique to the United States. My point is that this is a universal pattern. And what I'm saying probably is reflective of the human animal. They reflect the basic, if you want to use the word nature, and I'm not that comfortable with it because we don't know what the human nature is, but it's the closest thing to what political scientists would say is the characteristic of human uh, behavior. Political scientists often quote Aristotle who said man is a political animal. But what does this really mean? If you mean that human beings are deeply interested in politics, that is probably not true. Uh, but if you say that human beings are interested in power, that's probably true. But remember, the base of power oftentimes is in economics, not in politics. For example, look at the subscription for Wall Street Journal versus New York Times. Uh, the Wall Street Journal at least is three times larger in subscription. So people have much greater interest in economics. So I'm really challenging this notion that political scientists have propagated and that man is a political animal. What I just showed you is that most people are not terribly interested in politics. Having said that, uh, there is a cautionary note that I want to add here, and that is the biggest mistake anyone can make interpreting what I just presented to you is to think of this as an intelligence scale. That is to say that the attentive public are more intelligent than the non-attentive public. Nothing can be further from the truth. You could have a PhD uh, astrophysicist working on the Mars Curiosity rover in that bottom 20%. They're simply not interested in politics. So what this pyramid really shows more than anything else is the level of your interest in politics. And what I'm proposing or what the conclusion that I'm reaching is that the overwhelming majority of people are not deeply or terribly interested in politics. And as I mentioned, uh, the, the, this pyramid is one way that is used is to uh, distinguish um, by way of conclusion the attentive from the non-attentive public. There is a second use that I want to make of this analytic device and that is to use the pyramid as a basis to uh, talk about elite composition. And in that context I will also want to use it to talk about 
uh, political participation as well. The political participation, if you recall, or, or I already used the pyramid, and perhaps it makes sense for me to begin with that one first and then go to the elite composition. So if you look at the political participation pyramid, uh, I want to uh, give you some data related to the Middle East to some, well, I'm going to compare it with Europe too, to some extent, at least part of Europe. So looking at the political participation, let's look at the 10% political participation. Recall what that means. When, it, when that line goes to uh, 80%, goes down, that is mass politics. So at 10%, you're looking at societies, you're looking at polities that are pre-mass politics. So if you think of that period and look at the Middle East compared with a European country, Italy in 1900 was about that, that uh, level, about 10% of the Italians uh, before Garibaldi started to create an Italian nation. So Italy in 1900 is at 10%. Turkey in 1912, just before uh, World War I, reaches that position. Egypt, 1927, is at 10%. Iran, 1952. Saudi Arabia, really, up to 1972, really was not a very much, it was a pre-mass politics. And the little uh, Sheikhdom of Oman, or Kingdom of Oman, on the Persian Gulf, 1987. So, again, you can see the, uh, the pyramid allows you to be able to compare uh, at which stage various countries were in the pre-mass politics. So looking at Iran's journey toward mass politics to illustrate this point, uh, let me begin by uh, again subdividing that into two phases. In the case of Iran, in the phase one, uh, you're looking at political participation uh, that was at 1 to 2 percent in the very phase one. So basically, when you look at that, you have to remember that hardly anyone, except for maybe a city or two in Iran at that period, would be classified as political participant. So when you have 1 to 2 percent, that's a very, very tiny percentage. And the most amazing thing about Iran in this phase is this. You have a revolution in 1905. And that revolution leads to five years of liberal democracy, very liberal constitution, borrowed from Belgium. And this is one of those oddities Everything you read in the literature tells you that at this very early stage, you should not be getting uh, a liberal democracy. The literature says that unless you have a literate population, you cannot have a liberal democracy. Then the question is, how was this possible? We shall answer this uh, in more depth when we get to Iran, but for now, if you ask yourself, why did liberal democracy emerge in Iran in 1906? The answer really lies in what I discussed during the earlier segments when I was talking about the elite, when I talk about the aristocrat being the first change agent. So the answer really is exposure to the West. The aristocratic children that were studying abroad, they came and they learned about uh, constitutional democracy, they learned about constitutional monarchy, they borrowed the constitution from Belgium, they came here and they succeeded in their revolution. And the fact that they succeeded, it tells you how weak the central government was for a small group of people relatively in the capital to be able to take over. We will discuss more about 
the Iranian, the first Iranian revolution of 1905, a liberal democratic revolution when we get to Iran in the next few segments.